my appreciation to the organizers of the event. Um, I want to thank everyone in the background. I know it's a lot of hard work. And to say the least, I'm very grateful um, to be here in Guyana. Um, by this point of the day, I know that everyone's a bit tired. Uh, so to make things interesting, I will buy anyone in the audience a beer um, if you can recite my speech back to me later today. Um, so let's get into it. So listening to the speeches these past few days and feeling the excitement around Georgetown, um, it's very clear that Guyana is a tremendous growth opportunity. And this applies not only to the local energy uh, sector, but to the transformation of the entire CARICOM region as a whole. With good governance and strategic planning, I believe that Guyana has the opportunity to not only become an energy hub, but also a logistical, commercial and manufacturing powerhouse. I recently wrote that, that Guyana um, can become the, ne the next United Arab Emirates of Latin America. I genuinely believe that's the case um, if it can accelerate the diver diversification of its economy and ensure that oil revenues are spent both strategically and transparently. As we all know by now, the discoveries in Guyana have been unprecedented, uh, both in terms of the success rate um, and the speed in which its resource has been developed. The discoveries have been so impressive and consistent that it has created a relative numbing effect. Uh, we almost expect new discoveries to be made on a monthly basis, but rather than praise the amazing findings um, and projections, um, we as a consultancy here at AMI uh, that works to ensure successful client engagements in Latin America, I wanna to briefly touch upon some of the risks that investors face in Guyana. That's something that I don't think has been covered um, very broadly in this, in this conference so far. So we wanted to pr provide a perspective based on our conversations uh, with investors and companies based in the US, Canada, and Europe. Um, so AMI, sorry, <laughs> AMI has seven areas of risk that we usually apply to evaluate the attractiveness of different sectors in the region. This ranges from community risk, as you can see, to political risk. And here, as you see in the slide, um, I decided to add a few that I thought were a bit more relevant to Guyana, such as local content risk. This risk answers things such as, are the local content requirements too high or bound to change for this specific sector? And is the local content legislation too complex and subject to political interference? Some of these questions are a bit broad um, and hard to answer, but we use several criteria um, and we applied a risk analysis to evaluate the attractiveness of what we see as the eight main sectors uh, for Guyana's future. So as you can see in the slide behind me, um, we use the scale that ranges from high risk, which is dark red, to low risk, which is white. So the research gave us a pretty clear, clear view of the sectors that are posed to do the best in the next five to 20 years in Guyana. To give us a relative comparison to another frontier market in the region, we also applied our analysis to Suriname's oil and gas industry. Suriname's oil and gas sector came out as medium to high risk because of a multitude of factors. So we know they have a distressed economic situation. Um, their oil discoveries are, are relatively unproven. Uh, they have an unclear local content policy and they also have a history of corruption and mismanagement by the government. So that um, is why they're medium to high risk in our analysis. When we look at um, the numerous sectors um, here in Guyana, and in more developed jurisdictions, such as Brazil's pre-salt fields, the, the capex necessary for exploration often reaches the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, before a significant discovery is made. That was the case in Guyana before 2015, um, which led to the sale of Shell, uh, Shell's participation in the Starbreck block. And in many other cases, no discoveries are made at all. Um, and that forces companies to go home with billion dollar holes in their pockets and nothing to show to, to shareholders and investors. We, we don't think that this means that Suriname is not a tremendous growth opportunity, but we still see it as relatively green and a quite risky jurisdiction. So you may be asking why we're talking about Suriname, but we wanted to have something to compare with Guyana's main sectors. Um, and as we see here, um, the only ones that fall in the medium to low risk categories um, our insurance, manufacturing, and oil and gas. All the other ones, such as um, 
such as uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, agriculture, those are all low risk sectors. So the reason why Guyana has a very good performance uh, is a result of a several different criteria. It has proven oil and gas discoveries, as we know. Its projected economic growth is outsta outstanding. It has a relatively stable regulatory framework and it has limited local community opposition. Um, so out of these sectors, I think it's, it's important to point out the, the renewable energy um, development and prospects in the country. So Guyana's energy demand will triple by 2026. Uh, and some of that will be satisfied with the 300 megawatt gas to power plant um, in, in Wales. But that project will need to be complemented by other sources of energy, right? Uh, there's the solar panels in the hinterland. There's the hydro project in Amelia and also wind power coming off the Atlantic. Um, but this sector also has opportunities related to the decentralization of the grid. And that's things such as battery storage, uh, the development of microgrids, uh, which are two very important tools in the electrification of rural areas, uh, preventing blackouts, which we've seen uh, as a big problem here in Guyana, and providing firm power to offset intermittency. Um, Guyana could also use its massive gas findings to produce blue hydrogen, which is a production of hydrogen using natural gas and carbon capture. And this could be extremely viable um, if Guyana moves forward with creating not only the gas to energy plant, but in an industrial hub that connects the infrastructure of the proposed gas to energy plant with other um, industrial facilities such as petrochemicals. And you know we're not oblivious to the challenges posed by these projects. There's red tape faced in the wind farm um, development in Hope Energy. Uh, there's next generation technologies such as carbon capture that are not yet feasible in many markets. But despite this, we believe that renewable energy is a sector with the greatest opportunity when considered relative to risk. Um, so that, that's not to consider say that oil and gas will not bring in uh, much greater revenues than renewables in Guyana. But we also know that the oil gas sector is also a much bigger target for political and local interference. So when we look at the, the 10 risk categories um, as, as seen here in the left column of our table, our, our analysis suggests that operational risk followed closely by partner risk are the two biggest concerns for co companies and investors alike. And we, we gathered this information through talking to different investors, um, foreign investors, and they echoed the statements uh, quite commonly across the board. So operational risk, when you ask, um, when you think about it, it can be pretty broad, but the way we see it is as follows. Um, is there adequate infrastructure to ensure these projects run smoothly? Is there local human capital to support these projects? Is there access to cheap, reliable energy and raw materials? Um, so those are all the questions we try to answer when we measure operational risk in Guyana. And the second largest risk, which is partner risk, essentially measures uh, what, what's the likelihood that a local partner successfully delivers on its obligations and commitments. So many people here, I think, would agree. Full employment, even though only one, only two of the 10 FPSOs that they predict are currently operational. So you may think, okay, there's only two operational now. What's going to happen when there's 10 uh, FPSOs operating? I don't think this means that, that there's no qualified companies around uh, or that Guyana, Guyana can rise to the challenge. On the contrary, I think that from the people I've spoken to and from being here, I believe the Guyanese people are extremely eager and willing to participate in this economic transformation. Sometimes all they need is, is a, a shove by a foreign company, a push, uh, a bet, um, and use them, use their services. But to get there, we also believe that you need due diligence and, and good connections to help these foreign companies find the right partners and limit reputational hiccups. Um, in, more generally, we think better education, starting from the primary level and rising through higher ed, as well as looser uh, immigration policy that attracts the diaspora to come back is also vital to develop the local capacity. 
There's also one point specific that I think is very important for us to mention, and that is what we're considering as transition risk. The risk is, is pretty hard to quantify, uh, but we aim to answer it based on two main questions. What role will the sector and the projects in it play in the path to net zero? And the question number two is how will the energy transition affect, affect the demand for projects within the specific sector? So in this chart, you'll see that oil and gas in both Suriname and Guyana are deemed as low to medium when it comes to transition risk. And that might be contradicting to what you've heard about the energy transition, et cetera. But there's, there's several reasons behind that. And the first is that the, the barrels of crude found in Guyana and Suriname uh, will emit around 500 kilograms of CO2 per barrel of crude. These are estimates, they're, they're not concrete figures. But when compared to heavier sour crudes in deep waters, this is much lower when it comes to emissions. So with the world trying to reach net zero by 2050, combined with uh, IMO requirements for lower sulfur fuels and shipping, this type of crude is in very high demand across the world. Uh, India has been importing a lot of uh, Guyana's uh, oil, for example. And this is complemented by the fact that at least 20% of the resources in the Starbreck block are gas. Uh, we think that's equivalent to around 16 trillion cubic feet. Um, and there's an even larger proportion of gas in block 52 in Suriname. As we all know, gas is gonna be a key energy source for, for this energy transition. So in this next slide, um, another important factor in, in Guyana and, and Suriname's longevity within this energy transition, it's its average break-even prices for its barrel of crude. In Guyana, the average price for its four, first four FPSOs is extremely low at, at around $30 per barrel. And these, these FPSOs, just those first four out of a projected 10, will produce over 800,000 barrels per day by the late 2025. That's more than the current oil production of Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. And I think the golden darling of all of this is Liza 2 well, which we know just pumped its first oil last week. Um, they're expected to have a, a, the lowest break-even cost out of all these four FPSOs at $25 per barrel. And that's cheaper than onshore Middle East resources. Um, so the bottom line is pretty simple. The reservoirs in the Starbuck block are relatively shallow. Uh, they have no salt, which means the wells can be drilled faster and cheaper than your typical offshore exploration project. And it also helps that both Guyana and Suriname have investor-friendly production sharing agreements, uh, both in terms of royalties and taxes. Um, it, it still remains to be seen if those uh, PSAs remain competitive uh, through the next couple of, of projects. Uh, but I think it's very important for the government to continue um, ensuring that investment comes into, into the country. So what does this all mean? Um, so it's low costs, right? Massive fines and very high quality crude. This will continue to attract investment even as capital for oil and gas projects um, diminishes. And the reality is that the demand for oil will only reach its peak probably by mid 2030s, if that. Um, so these projects will continue to persist. Um, and that's definitely the case for Guyana and most likely for, for Suriname as well. So these are all positive signs, um, but it doesn't mean that Guyana won't be saved from, from public pressure, both locally and abroad. Um, we have several NGOs, um, Greenpeace, et cetera, that will be very critical of Guyana's role uh, in this net transition. So we've already seen this criticism happen multiple times and, and the current government has um, repeatedly defended its right to develop its resources. We actually believe that the best way forward to start is to start using these oil revenues uh, to mitigate some of the climate impact in Guyana and across the broader CARICOM region. Uh, a friend of mine actually, Wazim Maula, recently suggested this exact point. Um, he said that Guyana's oil should be used as an insurance policy for climate change in the Caribbean. So this includes using the oil revenues to improve the seawall, to create a rainy day fund, um, to combat nat natural disasters in the region. So that's one, one possibility. In this next slide, hmm, I don't think it's switching, but, the next slide, here we go. The Guyanese government, as well as the private sector, can also create a, pr a profit 
by capitalizing on an untapped market for selling forest generated carbon credits. So both multinationals and investors are of course looking to reduce their carbon footprint. And there's already talks underway in Guyana for a carbon market. Buying carbon credits is a very simple way to do that. Uh, with, with Guyana's very high forest coverage expected at almost 90% and deforestation rates below half a percent, the country is really well positioned to create a fund that sells carbon credits internationally, not just locally. Uh, foreign countries and companies can also provide funding um, to Guyana in exchange for the in exchange for the conservation of Guyana's forest. We saw Suriname um, should implement low carbon technologies in their operations, use electrification for the FPSOs, and also abide to, to flaring limits. Um, and to, to ensure that this is done quickly and, and feasibly, uh, the government must develop or, or think about developing a carbon price um, and other regulations to attract these types of investments. So new, new frontier oil markets, they, they're quite in a tricky dilemma at this point. It, they want to accelerate their fossil fuel projects while remaining in the good, grace, good graces of developed countries. Um, it's become almost a repetitive, a deadbeat expression to rec recommend the diversification of the economy as a solution. But at the end of the day, Guyana should take a, a page out of um, the UAE's playbook and create a formal economic diversification roadmap. I think it's off to, to a relatively good start with the creation of its sovereign wealth fund, uh, but the government should also work with the private sector to build better infrastructure. Uh, and we see this with the Guyana Development in Initiative uh, to create a more robust healthcare system and, and improve its overall education levels. This is gonna require large investments from foreign and local companies. And that's, that can be accelerated via free trade zones um, and the provision of But we also think that this right should be revoked if revenues are mismanaged or the country strays away from uh, a reduced carbon footprint. It, it seems that Guyana is heading down the right path and it, it's well positioned to transform its economy and the region as we know it in a, in a broader sense. But it must ensure that it does not get lost um, in, this, in this new reality that, that was unimaginable uh, just a few years ago. Thank you all very much for listening and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you again.